Chairs No Waiting, episode number 493, How Smith Was More Than Otis. Two Chairs No Waiting is brought to you each week by the folks over at WeaversDepartmentStore.com. Drop by over at Weavers and check out the Colonel Harvey's Indian Elixir t-shirt. <laughs> That's right. If, you have, if you're feeling ill, if your mission in life is to have health and vigor and zest, get this t-shirt and join Colonel Harvey in that. If you're you want to be a little more slow paced, there's also a Pink Floyd, Floyd the Barber t-shirt. Head over to WeaversDepartmentStore.com and check it out. Two Chairs is also brought to you by donations from listeners just like you. The executive producer of episode number 493 is Court Howell. Thank you, Court. Court is one of our patrons over at Patreon.com, and you can join support for the show. I would appreciate it. You can head over to Patreon and click the link. I got, uh, according to this, I have 15 patrons right now for uh, about $34 an episode. Yay! It only cost me about, you know, 30 something dollars an episode to do the show. But hey, thank you. <laughs> I want to thank all of you that are patrons. I want to thank all of you that donate in any way, whether it's just giving me information about things that are going on in and around Mayberry. That happens, and that triggers me to do more stuff, and I appreciate that. Uh, folks, today, this episode, as I said, is about how Smith was more than Otis. Our special report this week is what we're going to start off with. So let's go ahead and hear from Randy Turner with This Week in Mayberry History. Welcome to This Week in Mayberry History, a report by special correspondent Randy Turner of the Gomer and Cooper Pyle Comic Book Literary Guild of the Mayberry Historical Society. Hal Smith was born on August the 24th, 1916, on the northernmost tip of Michigan's Lower Peninsula, and after his family moved, spent his early years on the northernmost edge of New York State, just over the border from Canada. After high school, he moved to Utica, New York, and worked as a DJ from 1936 to 1943, also utilizing his talent for doing voices. He left the radio station during World War II to join the Army, where he worked in special services providing entertainment to the troops. Once discharged, Hal relocated to California and quickly made his film debut in the 1946 film Stars Over Texas. Four years later, he made his television debut in an episode of The Ruggles, which starred Margaret Carey. And just two years after that, in 1952, he played his first recurring character, Charlie Henderson, in eight episodes of I Married Joan. He was also Floyd Munson in The Great Gildersleeves in 1955, and Hickey in half a dozen episodes of the 1958 western Jefferson Drum. 1958 was an important year for Hal. While he is unquestionably best remembered as Otis Campbell in The Indy Griffith Show, most Mayberry fans know that he also worked extensively as a voice actor. He made his voice debut in a 1958 Walter Lance Studios cartoon, The Bongo Punch. Hal's first animated series was another project with Margaret Carey, Clutch Cargo, a low-budget limited animation series that used the actor's actual lips, which were filmed and put into the animation for a truly bizarre effect. Still, Clutch Cargo aired for 51 episodes in 1959. That same year, Hal also began providing voice work for Hanna-Barbera on the classic series Quick Draw McGraw and the Huckleberry Hound Show. Hal continued to work busily in both genres. He appeared in films, including an uncredited part as a man in a Santa Claus suit in Billy Wilder's The Apartment, and TV series as varied as Bonanza to Leave it to Beaver. Of course, in 1960, he began playing the popular recurring character of Otis Campbell in Mayberry. Otis appeared in seven of the eight seasons of the show. He appeared nine times in season one, seven in season two, three to four times per season in seasons three through five, then only once per season in seasons six and seven. His character was used more sparingly toward the end and then dropped when General Foods raised concerns about a character who fit the archetype of the town drunk. Ironically, in real life, Hal was a teetotaler, 
And of course, when we last saw him in the 1986 TV movie, Return to Mayberry, Otis was sober. Hal was incredibly busy all throughout his time in Mayberry. At the same time he was playing Otis, he also appeared in 17 other live action series, including playing a recurring character in Valentine's Day, appeared in nine films, and provided voices for 22 different animated series and films. Before his career ended, he had voiced far more than a hundred characters. He notably voiced several characters for Disney, including Owl in the original Winnie the Pooh featurettes, and even voiced Pooh himself for a time after Sterling Holloway left the role. The breadth of his work in animation is far too broad to list here, but other well-known characters he at times voiced included Elmer Fudd for Warner Brothers, Goofy for Disney, Barney Rubble for Hanna-Barbera, and Goliath of Davy and Goliath for Cloakey Productions. After Hal's wife of more than 50 years passed away in 1992, his health deteriorated. Hal died of an apparent heart attack in 1994 at the age of 77. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening, and remember to take Andy's advice and go out there and act like somebody. Thank you so much, Randy, for that great report. Now, if you want to make sure you don't miss any of the things that Randy posts online, you can send him an email at turnersgrade at gmail.com, turnersgrade at gmail.com, and he'll make sure you don't miss any of the great stuff that he has going on around Mayberry. All right, guys, so uh, that was a great report. Uh, Hal Smith, now we've we've never really actually done an episode about Hal Smith, so that's got that's what got me thinking about this as randy did his report this week i thought you know i need to do a report or just cover a little bit more about this now randy did a great job one thing he did want me to mention to you was that he had said he was a teetotaler that was not quite true but hal smith almost never drank he did, he was not a drinker he he might drink uh, have a drink in in a social situation of some type, but he was not a drinker. So he's almost a teetotaler, never drank. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that because one of the stories I'm fixing to read to you or tell you about is actually related to that. Now there's a great book that was written called More Than Otis, No Boil Bull, <laughs> a salute to Hollywood actor Hal J. Smith. Now this is by John uh, Mashad. The third, he wrote this book, and uh, it's got some nice articles in here. So I wanted to read just a little bit out of one of them uh, because I didn't realize this. This is a, it's called The Price of Fame is an article that he had where he had talked to Hal Smith and got this information. Uh, so I wanted to share this with you. It says, uh, becoming a, a success in Hollywood can be a blessing or a curse to personalities portraying characters in the big screen. After Hal appeared in the Andy Griffith show as lovable Otis Campbell, he discovered a world of typecasting and was sometimes irritated by people criticizing his character. As a quote from Hal, he says, I was in a hardware store one time and my son, Terry, uh, was there with me. There was a guy looking through some nuts and bolts and stuff, and he looked up at me and said, Oh, you're the guy from the Andy Griffith show. I hate you, said Hal recalled. Hal said to him, wait a minute. What do you mean? He explained to Hal that his brother became an alcoholic after seeing Otis uh, drunk on an episode of the Andy Griffith show. Uh, you caused my brother to drink. He saw you drinking and he wanted to do it because of you. Hal defended himself and he pointed out that Otis had never been filmed drinking out of a bottle of alcohol on camera quote i never had been seen drinking on camera i sometimes held a bottle the only time i drank anything was when they made me a sobering drink remember when andy made that throughout the run of the andy griffith show smith was plagued with restaurant bartenders and fans offering him free alcoholic drinks he always turned them down quote strangers came up to me and asked me if i was sober Others were surprised to see me walk in the streets, said Hal in a 1991 interview. They sometimes thought I was a real drunk. I, don't re I can't recall the last time I had a drink, he said in 1991. The character also affected the life of his only son, Terry. 
Uh, they used to call him Little Otis at Brentwood Academy. He never really liked that. When I took him to school, the other kids gave me funny looks. I didn't know if they thought I was an actor or a drunk, said, Meth- said Hal Smith. Finally, one day, a kid asked Terry, Is your dad Otis? Is he a method actor? Terry's reply was, Yes, he practices every Saturday night. By the 1980s, uh, Hal Smith uh, learned to accept the popularity of his Hollywood character. He started attending Mayberry reunions, did a national Mothers Against Drunk Driving commercials, charity shows, and signed many autographs. Quote, It took some time for me to get away from playing a lot of drunk roles. I was paid good for them. People today love the character and the show. It's unbelievable. They come up to you and they want to hug you. And I enjoy making people happy as Otis Smith ended. He ended. That was the end of it. So I didn't realize that. I didn't remember that story. And uh, that was something I thought you guys might not know either. I never really thought about that with uh, Hal Smith. You know, that maybe he, I don't know, that, you know, he had uh, had people believing that he was really a drunk. I guess that's a <laughs> that's a good actor if that's the case. Uh, so here's another funny story that's from the same book. And this one's about with it's about the lion's roar is what it's called. But Margaret Carey, we've talked about her on here before. Margaret Carey was a reference model and actress uh, who played Tinkerbell, if you'll remember, in the Disney's 1953 classic Peter Pan. OK, that's who margaret was she was also Bess muggins on the andy griffith show we remember her right uh the scobies that were getting evicted she was the wife she was her as well all right so anyway she recalls the final time that she got to work with hal smith on a animated project or a project the series was called iffy it was an australian based cartoon with several uh voiceovers that needed to be done one character uh, Hal had to mimic in the show had a lion's roar. He roared like a lion. So Margaret says, I walked in the recording studio and there was Hal sitting on a stool right in front of a microphone. He seemed completely relaxed and listened to the other actors who were rehearsing different voices. Margaret remembered. He giggled a little and smiled broadly when he saw me and we gave each other a big hug. The veteran actress never knew that Smith was going what he was going to do next uh, for the reality of the characters he was playing. Quote, uh, when the talking lions part was coming up, Hal picked up a brown waste pass, a waste basket and turned it uh, upside down and turned all the trash onto the floor. He cradled the trash can in his arms and he read his lines in the deepest voice. And he finished with a roar, she added. A bit soon, the bit soon turned into an unexpected comical caper. Because Hal had placed his face halfway into the basket, blasting out the great roar. Roar. It was a spectacular roar, she said. This allowed the sound to be amplified by the container. And Hal was suddenly, uh, after this, started coughing deeply while the roar continued he started to cough said carrie somebody had been dumping their cigarette ashes in the waste basket and we were all laughing because as he came up for air we saw that hal's head was gray with ashes <laughs> i gave him a little mirror and a kleenex or two to wipe his face uh, carrie ended uh telling the story about the dialogue director's comments the dialogue director came out of the booth uh, after and onto the recording stage, and he said, Hal Smith, that's the best lion's roar I've ever recorded. He grinned. Unfortunately, the show was recast in Australia, since it was an Australian cartoon, such as show business. That was the last time I got to work with Hal Smith. I uh, heard him almost every day on Focus on the Family, where he played. Uh, on the Christian radio station where I worked, she said. It still gives me a lift when I hear Hal doing his thing. So that's a uh, 
That's a great story from Margaret. Now, if you'll remember, if you go back and listen to our interview with Margaret, there were several uh, stories that she told about Hal Smith in that interview. So go back and check out our interviews with Margaret Carey if you want to hear some more stories about uh, her memories with Hal Smith. Okay, so I got one more little bit out of this that I want to read you uh, and tell you about. And this was from Otis Campbell Day, which was in 1988. And uh, now Jim Clark, as we all know, is the presiding goober of the Andy Griffith Show Rue Hunters Club. And he's been promoting the television series for years as part of that club. And it's grown over the years to thousands, you know, well over a thousand chapters. Well, back in 1986, while visiting the CBS set, uh, the return to Mayberry, Jim Clark met Hal Smith and some other personalities from the show. It was at that time, uh, was the first time that Jim Clark ever met Hal, he says. He goes on to quote, We started to correspond with each other, and our club came up with the idea of honoring him and his Otis Campbell character, uh, said Jim. Uh, he liked the ideal, uh, so he was willing to make some personal appearances here in Nashville. On February the 13th, 1988, Otis Campbell Day was celebrated. Get it? Sell, 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 sell. He's in his. It was celebrated. Anyway, it was celebrated throughout the city of Nashville, Tennessee. Smith was presented with a key to the county jail. He conducted press interviews, appeared on Ralph Emery's Nashville Now show, and eventually traveled to Vanderbilt Law School to entertain a large crowd. Wearing his original Otis Campbell outfit, he staggered under the school's auditorium, uh, into the auditorium, and soon delighted spectators with his many cartoon voices and memories of the Andy Griffith Show. Musician and banjo player Doug Dillard also joined Smith to answer questions from the audience. There was a long autograph session, outlasting the formal presentation. Smith later dashed over to the Opry House for a filming of Backstage at the Opry with many legendary country-western musicians. The following day, Smith relaxed and enjoyed the sights of the city. Uh, Jim Clark says he treasures his last evening with Hal Smith after the events. He says, quote, My wife, Mary, and I brought Hal over to Roy and Bobby Carson's home for a nice southern cooked meal. Instead of taking him to a restaurant, we just went over to the Carson's. It was a nice and quiet dinner, and we were able to hear many of his stories, which we all cherish that memory. Jim also pointed out that Otis Campbell Day was not the last time Smith visited Nashville, Tennessee. He came back a couple of times. He came to the Opry in 1990, uh, to Opryland, I should say, for the Mayberry Cast Reunion, did some charity work for the American Heart Association, and appeared in Alan Jackson's country western video, Don't Rock the Jukebox. The head goober of the Andy Griffith Show Reorchers Club was also amazed at Smith's energy and his ability to recall names months after attending events. Quote, He was so jovial and willing to talk to strangers. A year later, he would remember people he saw and everything about them. He really had a remarkable memory. Uh, he would run his, he would just run us ragged. He would, we would all be exhausted for, and from following him around all day long, but he would be all charged up, said Jim Clark. So friends, that's just a little bit more about Otis. It's a great book. Uh, I don't know if you can still get this book. We used to carry it at Weaver's department store. Uh, it is more than Otis, no bull. And a salute to Hollywood actor Hal Smith. So this was a self-printed uh, book, and it's got all kinds of nice interviews and stuff like that in it. So if you run across a copy, I saw one on Amazon that was about twenty dollars. If you can still get it, uh, but that was uh, it's just a nice, a nice memories of our friend Hal Smith, Otis. Uh, I will tell you another short story. Uh, our friend Ken Junkin, who does. Otis, who does the tribute artist uh, for Otis, he gets approached more than you would believe with people uh, just who just love Otis. They just love him. And one girl in particular that Ken talks about often that I think he may have only met once 
was a, a lady that he met in Indiana. We were doing an event uh, back then. It was maybe in the Midwest, but it was not in Danville, Indiana. Uh, anyway, it was, we were at the event and a lady came up to Kenneth and started to cry. She was crying because she said her father re- reminded her of Otis or Otis reminded her of her father. So in seeing Ken, who her father had passed away, but seeing Ken as Otis, uh, she began to cry. And that impacted Kenneth. That must have happened back in the early 2000s, so 17 years ago or so. And he's never forgotten it, and he often tells that story. So that just goes to show you just a little bit that even a tribute artist of Otis, uh, he gets to see just how much how Smith impacted people's lives. That even today, people will still break into tears when they see a tribute artist portraying Otis because they love the character so much. I've done Bible studies before, and and we do the Mayberry Bible Study podcast that you can go and listen to. If you go to the twochairsnowaiting.com site, you'll see a link there to go to the Mayberry Bible Study podcast, which I also do. And I've always thought it's a great example of just how the people of Mayberry were. And we knew that Otis, he drank, he struggled with it, and Aunt B, and they talked about it uh, often, uh, just how much he struggles with it. So uh, they were always trying to rehabilitate him and help him. But wasn't that what was the special part? They didn't judge him. They just knew he had a problem, and they worked with him, and they loved him. And I hope, folks, that that's what we can do as we move forward in our lives, that we can just love one another and show that Mayberry spirit toward one another as we grow throughout our lives. Uh, Okay, so I've got one last thing for you. Uh, There is a great, uh, well, we all know about the Mayberry squad car. Everybody knows about that. We're all hearing about this. Well, I got a great letter. Now, this is from John Booth, and it came to me on May 15th. 2018 so it's been quite a while he says hey alan here in canada as i'm sure you're aware we have a great mayberry cult following too i did not know that but i love it that's great uh here he goes on to say what i did however was to take uh andy taylor out of the 20th century and bring him into the 21st century so i created a squad car he created a squad car and the pictures i'll post them online Uh, He says, uh, I created a squad car that he'd be driving around today, and I wear a uniform he'd have today. So he's got the squad car and the uniform that he'd have today. So I'm going to have pictures of this uh, uh, online. I've got pictures on the video you're seeing if you're watching it. He said, I chose a convertible because I could be part of police service parades And in due course, it became the car that all the chiefs would like to sit in. (laughs) I also have a James Bond flipped license plate, which says, I gotcha on the license plate. So this car, it's a Mustang, by the way. It's a very nice looking uh, convertible Mustang. Uh, He says, whenever I'd, uh, I'd park, people would come and reminisce about the 60s television show. The car was making me friends even before I would get out. So much so that I now use it along with our police force as a way of fundraising for many charities uh, like my friend Ken Anderson, the Mayberry Guru, does, including arresting people to be freed when they make donations to whatever fundraiser I'm involved in. Throughout the years, I promote the Andy Griffith Show reruns to people and have a lot of fun doing it. And I've attached three photos for you to enjoy. Uh, And so he said, thank you very much, John. Uh, I will post these pictures on our Facebook page. So if you weren't able to see them here. But John, thanks for taking the time to send those to me. That that is, (laughs) they're really, really neat pictures. As I said, it's a night, it's a, he didn't tell me what year it was, but it's a new Mustang, black and white. And it's got tag number, the tag on it says Sheriff. And it says, I gotcha, Mayberry County, North Carolina. And uh, he's got him on the front and the back. Uh, it's a very nice looking car. Hmm. I've got a 1963 Ford. 
Hmm, he's got a, he has a Ford Mustang. Somehow, I don't think I did this right. Hmm. Anyway, thank you, John, for writing in and sending in the pictures. Uh, it's nice to know that we have a bunch of friends up in Canada that are also fans of the Andy Grover Show. All right, folks, that is all I have for you tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I would love to hear from you. You can give me a call at 888-684-8415. You can email me at floyd at imabry.com, or you can just drop by the Two Chairs No Waiting Facebook page, leave messages there, or do, or go to twochairsnowaiting.com. All the links to everything I just said are there. So twochairsnowaiting.com, you'll find it all there. Friends, I love to hear from you. Uh, tell people about the show. Share the love. And, folks, we'll see you next time right here on Two Chairs. <laughs>